I've come to the RAF Museum in Hendon, North London. The RAF Museum spans over 100 years of history and I'm here today to find out what life was like for a Spitfire pilot in World War II. So let's go find out. <laughs> stands for Royal Air Force and their job is to protect Britain by responding to threats and preventing conflict in the air. World War II was a global war that lasted from 1939 to 1945 and involved a big majority of the world's countries. During the Second World War, Britain was at war with Germany and the RAF fought the German Air Force called the Luftwaffe. One of the most famous planes they used to do this was the Spitfire. But what was life like for a Spitfire pilot? Well, let's take a trip back to the year 1943 to find out. Wow, so this is a Spitfire. And you must be William, our Spitfire pilot. I am, nice to meet you. Yes, uh, unfortunately I haven't got that much time to talk. I could be scrambled at any moment. Uh, there is a war on, you know, Lauren. <laughs> got it. Thank you so much for meeting with me. Um, do you think I could have a go in the cockpit? You didn't listen to anything I just said, did you? Well, <sighs> very well, just this once. lot smaller than what I imagined actually. It is, isn't it? So there are so many different controls, mm. I don't really know where to begin. Well, uh, the most important one is the joystick in front of you. That's how you control where the aircraft goes. The Spitfire is very responsive to, uh, to your controls and it's almost like you have to think where you want to go and it, and it goes with you. And that, uh, that big bronze button in front of you, that's how you fire the machine guns. Now, ahead of you, that's how you aim. And a little red dot is projected onto that piece of perspex there, and you can see where the enemy are coming. To the left of you, you've got the throttle there. That's what makes the, uh, the Merlin engine made by Rolls-Royce. That's uh, what will make you fly through the sky at nearly 400 miles an hour. This is the canopy here and uh, when we're about to fly you reach behind you and you slide it forward and it clicks into place otherwise you're going to get very very cold indeed and you'll find it quite difficult to breathe if anything were to go wrong how do you get out under your seat there you'd find a parachute which would be attached to you and you would open the canopy up and you would jump out and you'd pull the cord so the main thing I've taken from being in here is that I never want to be a Spitfire pilot. <laughs> it looks really confusing and complicated and more than anything, really claustrophobic. So on that note, let's get out of here. <laughs> So obviously there are lots of different types of planes. What type of plane is a Spitfire? So it's a fighter, an interceptor. It's a monoplane because it's got one set of wings. It's not a biplane, which has two sets of wings, or three sets even like a triplane. So this is, a, in my time, very, very technologically advanced as a, as a very fast monoplane. But really the question we all want to know is, is it better than the German planes? It's very difficult to say. Of course, uh, all the news and information that's coming from the government would say that yes, the Spitfire is better than the enemy aircraft. However, out of the sun comes the yellow-nosed ME109, the Messerschmitt. It's uh, uh, quite a match for the Spitfire. The 
engine in it was made by Daimler Benz. It can dive much faster than the Spitfire. And it's got more weapons. So perhaps you might say that the Messerschmitt is a little bit better. But that's not what we want to hear. No. That sounds terrifying. Mm. Are you ever scared? Yes. Um, although once you get into the aircraft, your mind uh, steals. The scary bit is the waiting. We have to wait on the airfield. We get a telephone call and someone shouts, uh, squadron scramble. We have to run as quickly as we can, fly into the air. And it's that period of waiting. Uh, it's very, very difficult indeed. It can be quite scary. What do you do in that interim period? You have to be ready. In fact, the period of waiting is called the readiness. So we can't do too much. Sometimes we play a bit of cricket, kick a ball around. Uh, we read the newspaper. I've got one here, although uh, I've kept this one. It's, it's quite old. This one's from 1940. Look at that. Yes, thank you very much. It's a newspaper from the Battle of Britain. All the news is very, very positive. RF on offensive. <laughs> uh, in fact, sometimes the phone will ring and we'll think this is it, we're ready to go, this is time to scramble. And actually it's just uh, telling us that the naffy is here with the tea. <laughs> I love tea, I'm a big tea drinker. So you mentioned that you had to be ready to scramble at any moment. Does that include the night time as well? We tend to fly the Spitfire during the day, it's not so good at night time. We have to wake up at 3.30 in the morning to make sure that the Spitfire is ready to go in its process called dispersal and then we go into the readiness which is waiting to be scrambled. 3.30 definitely isn't the morning in my book, that's <laughs> definitely the middle of the night. Yes. <laughs> now obviously this is a time of rationing, does that affect you in the RAF? What do you have to eat? Eggs and bacon in the morning, of course. In the morning? Well, when I want it. The army, they were rather disgruntled by the RAF. They have uh, sort of not very good food and we tend to have uh, very good food indeed. Why is that? Well, uh, the good thing about being a pilot is you come home, whereas the army, they have to sleep on the ground and they sleep wherever they are and uh, they don't get as good food. Uh, how long did it take you to gain your weight? I think I started in the January of 1937 and by the April or May I had no wings. So I first were in two biplanes, a Tiger Moth, a rickety wooden aircraft, very good to fly, but not quite as fast or as manoeuvrable as the Spitfire. And during the war, if you're part of the volunteer reserve, sometimes you get uh, rushed through your training. And in fact, there's a story of a young pilot officer whose commanding officer asks him, how many hours do you have on hurricanes? And the pilot officer says, Sir, I've never seen a hurricane. He uh, draws the curtains, the commanding officer, and says, Well, that's a hurricane there. Uh, we'll get you on them tomorrow. Less than 10 hours in fighter aircrafts, some of the boys, before they fought the Messerschmitts. And everyone wants to be a fighter pilot. Um, and if you're picked for bomber command, often that's seen as uh, not as good. I disagree. I think uh, people who fly bombers, like the Avro Lancaster there, are incredibly brave men indeed. In fact, they think that the most dangerous job during this war is being a rear gunner in an aircraft like the Lancaster. And what is a rear gunner? What does that mean? So, uh, an Avro Lancaster like this doesn't just drop bombs, it also has guns on it to protect it. So the rear gunner is the gunner at the back. The enemy fighters would chase the bombers to make sure that they don't drop bombs on the German cities. If they're chasing the bomber, it's the rear gunner that's going to get most of the attack. When the war is over, what's the first thing that you're going to do? I'll probably have a long bath and um, take these boots off. <laughs> what do you most miss from, from home? Uh, probably uh, comfortable uh, trousers. <laughs> these woolen trousers can be quite itchy. <laughs> So I wondered if you could take me through a few of the training exercises that you had to go through in order to join the RAF. Well, I could, uh, I could certainly uh, train you up, see if you're ready to be part of the RAF. I could do that indeed. Thank you. Let's go. Tunnel.
very good. The learning very quickly. Right, I'm going to come down now and do some more things. So uh, let me see some star jumps. Some star jumps, that's it. 10, 9, 8, 1. Now imagine that the enemy are coming bombers and we've got to take cover, so get into the shelter. Ah. Did I pass? I think you did, Yay! Lauren. You did very, very well at your RAF training, and I would give you a pair of wings if I could. Uh, because unfortunately, being a fighter pilot, you had to be a man. I see. So, being a woman, is there any role that I could play within the RAF? Of course. You could join the Women's Auxiliary Air Force or become a WAF, it's a group of uh, elite women who would uh, help. The boys in the Spitfire are currently. So you might be in a map room at RAF Uxbridge, plotting where the enemy are coming and showing where the different squadrons are in order to scramble the pilots up to defeat the bombers during the Battle of Britain, for example. You could also fly in a Spitfire, not into battle, but another very important, very dangerous job. There was something called the ATA, or the Air Transport Auxiliary, which were women, it was a civilian organisation, and women would fly the Spitfire from the factories or depots to the stations like here at RAF Hendon, delivering those Spitfires that are, that are vital for the boys in the war. So am I right in saying that women are actually paid the same as men in the ATA for doing the same role? Yes, they are. You're absolutely right. Which makes them one of the first equal opportunities employers. Right then, so that's the ATA for me. <laughs> oh, sorry Lauren, I, I've got to go. Uh, I'm being scrambled. Good day, well done. Right then, that's my cue to find my way back to the 21st century. Stand down boys, it's just a nappy again. Hey, William! William! Does this thing come with a parachute? Anyone fancy a copper?